Hold on, it's coming. Almost there. There are plenty of us out there who I'm sure have ended up missing out on a few gaming franchises over the years that could have possibly gotten them hooked on an entire genre of games. What's more unfortunate is that sometimes when you finally do get a chance to play them, their gameplay may not be as revolutionary or are inspiring today as people saw them as of the time of their release. So when you think about it, having a series that's big as crutch comes from its story and characters can almost make a game timeless when done right. And in my humble opinion, the Danganronpa games are some that I feel best fit this criteria. The story of a group of master skilled students plunged into a world where they are forced to commit murder against one another to survive sounds like a recipe to land many a man or woman on antidepressants by the end of it all. And while these games will certainly twist your emotions in more ways than one, it's ultimately a story about clinging onto the hope you have, overcoming the world's despair, and never forgetting those who are have given you a reason to keep that hope alive. My hope, for instance, is that by the end of this video, I will have less than 15 comments telling me how I have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. For you see today, I, as the ultimate list maker, will be the one judging those that I feel are forever blackened and those who have risen to become our beacons of hope, as I pick out the worst to best students from the Danganronpa series. Warning, this intro kind of went on for a bit too long, but I felt the need to lay out a ton of things first. If your attention span is too short or this video is just five minutes too long for you, please jump to the time code below and forfeit all right to complain. Now while last time I got a chance to examine a mixture of both storytelling and level design, this time around it's all about character, how deep their backstories go, how significant to the plot they are, and just straight up how memorable they are at the end of the day. And with that said, I'd just like to say I sure picked a hell of a series to test this out on first. When I first considered doing a worst to best video on this series, I had originally only envisioned the main stories from each of the three mainline games, those being Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc, Danganronpa 2 Goodbye Despair, and Danganronpa V3 Killing Harmony. Unfortunately, I did not take into account the unlockable in-game novellas, the spin-off game Danganronpa Another Episode, Ultra Despair Girls, the manga and light novels, not to mention the anime that continues the ongoing main storyline while also giving us some insight to before the events of the first game. It is a lot to take into account, thus I am left with three options. A. I turn around and burn all the hard work I've already put into this video so far. B. I go full on with it, diving into every corner of Danganronpa that I can find so as to minimise people leaving comments on what I've missed out or simply don't understand. Or C. I simply draw a line in the sand, outlining what material I'm going to be referencing and hope that they understand that I can't can't perceive every bit of information on a series of this magnitude. So yeah, I'm gonna go with the latter here folks, seeing as even if I did take into account all the material available, I'm sure I'd come across too much that ended up contradicting itself throughout, especially in regard to everything set before the first game. So on top of the three main games I mentioned, I'm also going to be adding in Ultra Despair Girls, and that is all. Now I'd love for us to jump into things, god knows this video is long enough as it is, but there are a few points and omissions that I unfortunately need to bring up before we begin. For starters, this series has a lot of plot twists in it. Like a lot. Like a lot a lot. So, for me to even attempt to talk about this series and its characters, I have no option but to go all spoiler heavy on this video. So, if I have piqued even the slightest bit of your interest in this series, I strongly recommend playing through these four fantastic games on either PS4, Vita, or PC before you continue on with this video. A big ask to say the least, especially considering the length to some of these games, but honestly, I do very much care about you getting to have just as much of a satisfying time with these games as I did, and I'd hate to hinder that in any way. So starting now, all secrets are on the table, and I can finally switch over to the spoiler heavy footage. So let's go ahead and outline which characters I have lined up. As expected, all entries are students of Hope's Peak Academy and the Ultimate Academy for Gifted Juveniles, with the exception of Kamaru, who I felt necessary to include. With that said, not all students will be a part of this list, and those students are Mukuro, aka the Ultimate Soldier. While her backstory is intriguing and she was technically a student, her time was not only very brief, but she wasn't even playing herself for the time. Plus, when you do get to find out the truth about her, she's already been a corpse for the last few weeks or so and plays no other part other than to serve as an example of her sister Junko's twisted nature. The Warriors of Hope. Despite their age, they technically are students of Hope's Peak, it's just the kindergarten version is all. 
However, we don't exactly interact with them in the typical Danganronpa sense, and it basically will just come down to me ranking each one's abusive childhood. And that doesn't sound very fun now, ladies and gents. The Ultimate Imposter, aka Fat Byakuya. Similar to Mukuro, the Ultimate Imposter is someone who ends up lying about themselves and only shows the briefest of hints as to what they're like in real life, and, well, one of his traits is not hard to miss, at least. This brings up a significant hurdle to bear in mind. If you know the games, then you know that not every character is truthful about who they actually are, and thus it can be a bit hard to judge them when many of our interactions have been lies of sorts. Admittedly, if I took into account V3's ending that much, this whole list would find a way to catch fire on its own. So in the end, we are left with 15 students introducing the original Danganronpa, another 15 for its sequel, just one for its spin-off and finally 16 from V3 landing us with a whopping 47 students to rank up and I think it's high time we crack on with it at last starting off with number 47 Hyoko aka the ultimate traditional dancer while Danganronpa has plenty of kind-hearted characters, it's no stranger to having mean-spirited ones as well. Hyoko fits into that adorable little girl who's secretly a sadistic archetype that we've seen on more than one occasion on a number of Saturday morning cartoons, except rather than being an adversary, we have to drag her around everywhere and constantly put up with her unpleasant attitude. There's a lot of things to hate about Hyoko. She has no filter, has little to no empathy, feels superior to everyone, will play innocent when called out on things and enjoys the feeling of killing bugs and crabs. How is it she wasn't killed first again? What gets me the most though is her incessant need to verbally abuse Mikan, which really, personally, ticked me off. We do find out that she loves all things Japanese and in turn hates how other cultures have warped her own in some way. She fears that traditional Japanese dance is becoming more forgotten by the day, possibly leading to some insecurities, though I'd say the supposedly multiple attempts on her life may have more to do with that. Hyoko does later manage to form a sort of big sister-like connection with Mahiru, but unfortunately, thanks to Mahiru's untimely death, this does little to no positive impact on how she treats her other classmates later on. Admittedly, I did feel a little sorry for her at first for not being able to change out of her kimono due to my hero no longer being around, but then after looking back at how she was glad about Teroteru's death or how she suggested that the students who were already infected should just off themselves, I lost all sympathy for her. There is little to no development in her becoming a better person and her need to torment others is just painful to watch. Characters like Byakuya and Koichi may have stepped over a few lines, but at the very least, they were still interesting at the end of the day. Hyoko is a nightmare that I simply wish to be rid of. Had she not died around the same time as Ibuki, I would have felt nothing for her loss. Number 46. Hafumi aka the ultimate fanfic creator. I was so sure this guy was destined to be at the bottom of my list, but Hyoko made my blood boil just that little bit more. Having spent much of his childhood without friends, mostly from him snapping at just about anyone trying to be friendly, Hafumi would wind up finding comfort after watching an anime named... I'm... I'm sorry, I can't. My, my brain just won't let me. And ended up having a dream about its main heroine, leading to quite the obsession for the next few years with him writing his own stories about her falling in love and doing embarrassing acts. Needless to say, Hafumi takes his craft very seriously to the point that he only attends free-for-all so he can crush those he feels are unworthy in his eyes, comparing himself to a dark overlord and then the low-level RPG adventurers who he should eliminate early on before he regrets it later. This level of superiority amongst his peers for just not getting it man can get so eye-rolly throughout and when he's not proclaiming his intelligence he's usually drooling over or making perverted remarks towards the female student. Students. The guy just has a level of discomfort to him that just makes me want to take a shower after being around him for too long. The only semblance of a connection I can really form is his goal to one day create something just as good as the stories he loves. Other than that, he's an almost unintelligent, easy to manipulate child who gives fanfic writers a bad name. Number 45 Samugi, aka the ultimate cosplayer. Well, 
shit, how do I get into this character now? I mean, it's one thing for a character to lie about their entire identity to the very end, it's another thing when that character just completely obliterates the fourth wall in the process. For the majority of the game, Samugi is seen as an average geek and wrapped with much of geek culture, but in secret is the biggest fangirl to Danganronpa in the world, as well as the mastermind to the 53rd Killing Games. While I'd rather not go into the almost endless discussion that the ending to V3 provides, it's definitely hard to not think about said reveal when bringing her up. Considering Samugi is supposedly the only character to be completely self-aware of her and her classmates' actual reality, it can be even harder to divulge the truth behind her disguise than even with characters like the Ultimate Imposter and Mukuro. While naturally her free time gives us little to work with, one could draw a line between her love of becoming a fictional character, her fear of seeming too normal in the eyes of others, as well as the joy she has out of seeing others express their interest in what type of character they would want to dress up as. The thing is, even if Susumi wasn't lying, at the end of the day, her own character, that we can assume at the very least she had total control over, is just not a very interesting one. Number 44. Kyo, aka the ultimate anthropologist. When you hear about anthropology and Kyo's views on humanity, you assume that it's all going to lead to something deep and meaningful at some point. Well... Because of his deep knowledge into various religions, myths, and cultures, Kyo finds joy in both the compassionate and chaotic interactions between humans, which is certainly very fitting for a series like Danganronpa. Surprisingly enough though, it's eventually revealed that one of his hobbies is to kill a set number of girls so they can be friends with his now deceased sister. Now, how does his ritualistic killing connect back to anthropology? I have no idea guys. There is honestly nothing hinted at that links these two together. During his childhood, Kyo would spend almost all of his time looking after his sick older sister to the point that he formed a unbreakable connection with her, we'll say. After reading a children's book to her and being asked to research into other tales related to it, he took up anthropology in her name, along with wearing nothing but the outfit she had handcrafted for him. As reasons go for taking up anthropology, it seems like it would have made more sense for it to have been his sister's dream originally to learn about all these different cultures, with Kyo taking over due to her illness slash death, but what do I know? The biggest problem with his killings are not just that they are the least sympathetic of them all and end up having nothing to do with the present motive, but there was nothing besides the tools needed to perform the seance that required him to kill anyone around that time. Celeste at the very least knew after the cash prize motive was announced that she would finally be able to make her dream a reality. As I said, there is potential for something deep and eye-opening with this character. It's just too bad he makes next to no sense. Number 43. Leon, aka the ultimate baseball star. For as expendable as Leon might be to the plot at the end of the day, I still kind of like the idea behind him that separates him from the other students. With so many, we see how their talents have helped define their interests and goals in life, but not the case with Leon. Despite his rare baseball skills, he actually deeply hates the sport except as a way to pick up chicks. Thus he sees it as a stepping stone to achieve his actual dream of becoming the lead singer of a punk band. Unfortunately, his reasoning for wanting to be a musician is simply just to impress a girl he met one time and that's it. There's little indication that he puts any effort into his craft, showing little concern over keeping his skills up to date and believing that being a musician is even easier when your genre is punk and you can rely on looks alone. His reason for killing, while not exactly planned out and simply turning a misfortune into an opportunity, is one that feels like it was intended to simply test the waters out while not going too off the rails in the first few hours. Maybe his lack of appeal was intentional for the same purpose, but instead of swing and a miss in my book. Number 42, Hero, aka the ultimate clairvoyant. While some students can push their talents to go beyond people's expectations, Hero proves that being the ultimate clairvoyant, with apparently a success rate of 20%, does very little to get you ahead in life and on this list as well apparently. At first there was a part of me that did flock to Hero early on, mostly due to how carefree he seemed at first, but once it finally hit him how real everything was, his personality really started to grate on me fast. Because of his wide belief in both the supernatural and extraterrestrial, he's often used early within the trial 
trials to derail them to get the obvious facts out of the way first, like questioning whether someone who was so obviously alive is in fact a ghost or not. Having not made the smartest of financial decisions in recent years, Hiro does what he can to sell his services at overwhelmingly steep prices in order to pay off his debts for scamming the daughter of a man with ties to the mob. Admittedly, there was some form of humour to be found in Hiro's blatant stupidity, but the same can't be said for his multiple attempts to trick Makoto into buying into his crap. By the time he starts guilt tripping Makoto into selling his organs and identity to him, you're just ready to let Karma hit this guy like a ton of bricks so he'll just learn something. We get some hints here and there about how he's aware of his stupidity with him even admitting to being held back in school repeatedly, but I'm sure you all agree with me that being an idiot doesn't give you a pass when it comes to forcing your problems onto others, especially when you admit to having other means to pay off said debts but are too stubborn to do so. I'm aware that the character gets a bit better in the short story that came with Ultra Despair Girls, but as I said, I'm keeping things strictly to what can be obtained from the main narrative here. He's not the worst, but ugh, god, his selfishness. Number 41. Teru Teru, aka the ultimate cook. There are undeniably a lot of things to dislike about Teru Teru at first glance. He's unbelievably horny towards many of his classmates, he's very boisterous about his skills, did I forget to mention he's very horny? With that said, Hidden Behind the Togue is a somewhat relatable character who manages to help you forget about his more perverted side eventually. Unlike a Fumi who killed someone simply because he was obsessed with an AI for the wrong reasons, Teru Teru actually has one of the more relatable motives in the series with him determined to find out the fate of his ill mother. Like with Celeste, he's very much ashamed of his low class status from his family's diner to his almost indistinguishable accent. Other than his mother, his food and looks are what he cares about the most as they are what define him in his mind, even correcting people when they refer to him as a cook rather than a chef. While again, his pervy side can get really tiring, they do hint to him possibly being this way as a result of his, well, very sexually active siblings. He also shows how much he cares for both what people's interests are, food wise, and what their opinions are on his dishes as well. To compare him to a free course meal, he's a terrible starter, decent main course, and finally a satisfactory dessert. Number 40, Rantaro, aka the ultimate adventurer. One of the great things about the series is how each character, with one or two exceptions, helps in how the narrative ramps up with intensity based on such things as their beliefs, their talents, their weaknesses, and so on. Rantaro though is kinda there to seem ominous, ask one or two unusual questions, and then kinda randomly die, only to briefly come up towards the end so as to add a bit more to the game's overall mystery. During his brief time in the main story, he comes off as a pretty normal guy who seems irritated at times for not knowing the facts, but more often comes comes across as amused over such questions as his lack of talent or how they came to be trapped together. While there may not be that much to pick up on during the main game, we are given a better insight into his own personal struggles thanks to his free time with Kaede and bonus mode with Suichi. We find out that Rantaro not only grew up in a well-off family who did much travelling, but also has a lot of guilt hiding inside after losing his sisters on his travels, considering himself a failure as a brother. One could say that his many travels are the reason for his friendly attitude towards people and have allowed him to better understand others even if he's only known them for such a short amount of time. His inclusion and fast exit from the main narrative can easily be seen as a way to break fan expectations considering the series history for what I like to call the walking question mark trope. In a way, Rantaro feels like there is meant to be more lying behind those eyes of his, but due to his purpose, he has little that comes off as interesting besides him rediscovering his talent. His backstory was compelling at first when you find out about him losing his sister, but then you find out later he somehow managed to lose multiple sisters across the globe, making me kind of have to agree with him not being that great of a brother. Number 39. Mahiru, aka the ultimate photographer. Sometimes I wonder, had a character lived long enough, could we have gotten to have seen more out of them? I find this question most relevant to Mahiru, seeing as I have a hard time remembering anything about her other than her bossy attitude towards most of the male students. We get tidbits in regard to her family backstory, with her mother being a globe-trotting war photographer, inspiring Mahiru to focus on her work towards people smiling, mostly women. Her zero tolerance for men's lack of hygiene and manners is implied to come from her years of having to look after her 
her lazy father with her being very insistent about doing the job herself so that it's done right. She starts taking care of Hiyoko after she begins to smell in light of not bathing, leading to one of the most are you fucking kidding me lines I've ever seen. As mentioned, her time with Hiyoko is short lived and nowhere near as compelling or as interesting as it is with the likes of Hina and Sakura or Himiko and Tenko. Again, had we gotten to see more of a change out of Hiyoko, that in turn would have likely also won a few points to Mahiru, showing just how much of a void was left after her tragic death, but sadly, there was just so little to focus on. Number 38 Kibo, aka the ultimate robot. I find there's a bit of an uphill battle when it comes to talking about Kibo, both in his relation to V3's climax, but also on a more character-based level as well. Being a machine, you'd think there'd be a lot of potential to ask some very thought-provoking questions. And while there are some brought up in regard to the use of artificial talent, I never really felt like we got to explore something in the same ballpark as some of science fiction's greatest works. For the most part, Kibo is relatively normal, even for a robot, with his only notable personality traits being him taking great pride in his many rather un impressive features, along with his tendency to feel discriminated against, at times for justifiable reasons, and other times, not so much. One issue I do have is with the lack of understanding behind how Kibo sees himself as a machine. At first he makes it clear that he wants to impress people with his features, but then later on is dismissing the idea of using said features as a way to get a leg up in life. It's clear that he feels incredibly insecure when being described as ordinary, and that he wants to believe that his title means much more to his classmates than just that he exists, and that's it. It's surprising it surprised me when he admitted to only opening up Suichi at first because he saw him as beneath him, seeing as there was very little to suggest that he saw any of his classmates that way. He does naturally change as a person during free time, understanding that he doesn't need to be the best at any particular thing for others to accept him. Near the end, it's revealed in a bit of a meta twist that Kibo's decisions are being dictated by the outside world, with him interpreting them as his inner voice. I think my main gripe with Kibo is that it feels as if they are trying to have their cake and eat it, with him claiming that he can't comprehend various human emotions, yet he's often found to be one of the more emotional ones of the group. Who knows, maybe I'm the real robot here because I have little idea what I'm supposed to feel. Number 37 Mew, aka the ultimate inventor. The Danganronpa games have certainly dabbled around when it comes to the more crass sense of humour of today, but Mew certainly has a way of making pure poetry out of her dialogue. Looking back over all the students, it's surprising how very few of them tend to brag about just how awesome they are. Mew most definitely has what you'd call an inflated opinion of herself, seeing both her brain and her body as a gift to all of mankind. Having started out relatively normal, Mew's life took quite the unexpected turn when she ended up in a coma after a car accident, only to wake up with mad ideas left and right, most of which fitting in with her more vulgar sense of humour. Over the course of the game, we see her rely heavily on a confident and prideful persona in front of others, drawing much attention to her genius and supposed sexual desire from others. Of course, when pushed on these topics, she will almost always submit in front of everyone, sometimes even taking pleasure from the humiliation. With the exception of Leon, Celeste, and possibly Teratero, depending on how you see it, she's one of the few to break under the pressure of being isolated from the world. World, giving her one of the weakest motives to commit murder in the series, even if she never does succeed in the end and is used more as a stepping stone for an other more tragic event. Her inventions do find their way pushing the story forward more than once, however towards the end they can feel very convenient an awful lot, making her seem more godly than I think they intended her to be. It's heavily implied that much of her over the top personality is a result of her accident, the surgery afterwards, or a combination of them both. Given something was likely lost in order for her to gain her newfound creativity, it would have seemed poetic of sorts to have given her something to strive for that she couldn't invent, such as a lost memory or something along those lines. But no, unfortunately, she's much like the majority of her inventions. Good for a chuckle, but little use outside of that. Number 36 Karumi aka the ultimate maid. Being the ultimate maid, you'd think Kurumi would just be good at the usual skills of cooking and cleaning, but as we discover, in order to fulfill every one of her master's requests, she seems to have done more than enough to prepare herself for the uphill task standing in her master's way. Whether it be writing, politics, or strategic planning, she has all of her bases covered in case of any event. What makes all of this even more amazing is how she never once takes credit for how much she has contributed to so many other successes. With that said, there is a burning question on my mind, and that is simply, 
why? Why does she choose to become a maid? Why is she so eager to put the needs of others before her own? Why does she get passed around so much when she's clearly a golden goose to many? On top of that, does she get paid? If so, what does she spend it on when she shows little to no attachment to any earthly possessions? I just want to know more about the girl behind the servant is all. With that said, her need to escape in order to save the people of Japan is one of the more understandable motives, weighing the lives of but a few to that of an entire country. Her determination to never fail was seen at its most despair-like with her attempts to emotionally manipulate her classmates to spare her, along with her attempt to make one final break for freedom. In a way, she's more machine than the actual robot, with her lack of self-goals and flaws ending up working against her, honestly. Number 35. Kazuichi, aka the ultimate mechanic. Like with Hiro, there was a part of me early on that felt I could have made a strong connection with Kazuichi, but sadly his stick, that being his obsession with Sonya, wore very thin fast. He's almost always cowering over the possibility of death, he tends to let his imagination run wild, and his one moment of true hope is squandered by him revealing only moments later that he did it to impress you guessed it, Miss Sonya. It's because of said obsession that he's barely able to have any redeeming moments during the main game. And while I do have my own problems with how Sonya retaliates towards his obsessive nature, it's nowhere near the same level of cringe as to how he reacts to every interaction with her. With that said, while this was all a huge turn off for me, I can't say I wasn't feeling something as I started to learn more about his love of machines and his school life. Growing up in a low income family and having to work at his father's bike shop, Kazuichi found a love of deconstruction constructing all manner of machines along with reconstructing them afterwards though with varying results. In both a humorous and tragic twist of fate, despite his deep love of vehicles, he ironically gets motion sickness easily, hindering his dream of giving a girl a ride in one of his creations. Due to being seen as an outcast in school, along with an incident that led to one of his only friends using him to then betraying him soon afterwards, Kazuichi had his optimistic trust in others flipped, taking on a more punk-like look afterwards to ward off any who could potentially hurt him. It's a rather compelling tale that speaks to someone like myself who felt the need to distance themselves from others. I truly wish I could split Kazuichi into two separate beings here, but sadly there's not enough here to give him a pass for acting the way he does throughout the main storyline. Number 34 Angie, aka the Ultimate Artist I don't know about you all, but for me personally, Angie was definitely one of those students I found the hardest to be around, and a big part of that comes from whenever her religious side starts to dip into that grey area that makes her sound more crazed cult leader than naive oracle. I tend to enjoy many of the characters who are there mostly to contrast with the whole, you know, students killing one another. Angie though definitely takes this to an uncomfortable extreme, spending 95% of the time smiling, even during some of the more sombre moments, and has a habit of getting a little too close to others. Despite being given the title of Ultimate Artist, she gives all credit to her god Atua, which after looking up actually is loosely connected to Polynesian beliefs, who apparently uses her as a vessel thanks to being the oracle for her island. Because of her dedication to her god, she bases all of her decisions on what she defines as a sign from Atua. She's definitely one of the hardest characters to read and will either go against those she's closest with, as seen when she intensifies the spotlight on Himiko during the second trial. Despite her rather calm presence, things can get rather intense around her far like her using others' needs in order to convince them to depend on her for guidance, along with taking initiative by removing the class's need to escape by blocking off the death road and destroying the flashback light. Under a different light, her acts could be seen as her genuinely wanting the best for everyone, it's just that her methods are probably better suited back home rather than here. As a confrontation of sorts, she does her job well with her really managing to get you worried as to what will happen next during the third chapter, but as a relatable character... Yeah, no, I'm fine, thanks. Number 33. Tucker, aka the ultimate moral compass. While the 78th class of Hope's Peak doesn't ever really elect a leader, the job of preserving order and structure within the class falls very much in the hands of Tucker, who takes it up without even a second thought. His attitude of pushing Makoto and others may seem a little bit teacher's pet-like, but I can't help but admire his attempts to uplift them, even if his timing can be very off. His commitment to others and himself being the best comes from his desire to succeed where his grandfather, the former Prime Minister of Japan, 
failed, who he believes to have been born a genius from the start and put little effort in, leading to him and his family to its downfall. Eventually he begins to butt heads with Mondo, but the two surprisingly form a bond fast after what we can assume to be a truce after each one failed to best each other in the steam room. His own sense of hope eventually comes crashing down when Mondo is out as the killer in the second trial, something Tucker refuses to believe to the very end. With his moral compass now shattered, he loses how to view the world, with him acting almost brain dead at first, followed by him imitating Mondo soon after. His mental breakdown after Mondo's death seemed like it would have led to him understanding that morality is not as black and white as we're taught at such a young age, but of course they had to go and kill him off before we got to see any resolution to that plot point, almost as if they had planned for Hero to die in his place, but then rewrote it at the last second. Number 32. Sayaka, aka the ultimate pop sensation. One popular theme used throughout Danganronpa is how both hope and despair can find their way of being entwined with one another more easily than you'd think. For example, being reintroduced to a pop star you knew in person a few years back whilst being surrounded by strangers may seem like a blessing at first, until that said person is killed after trying to frame you for murder. Almost as soon as Makoto and his classmates wake up, he and Sayaka end up acting as a light for one another in these dark times, with them quickly forming an attachment due to being acquainted with one another before the events of Hope's Peak, with this connection only growing as the threat level increases by the day. It's only till the mastermind threatens the lives of Sayaka's bandmates that she makes the choice to use Makoto's trust to win her and her bandmates freedoms by staging it to look like he's committed a murder and have him willingly take the fall to protect her. As is brought up in the game, her final act to out her own murderer before her death can be seen as her either simply wanting to take revenge on Leon for foiling her plan, or out of regret for knowing that Makoto will still take the blame and die along with her. This also works herself back to the two's past conversations, with many of her pep talks seemingly being viewed as Sayaka trying to forge this white knight in shining armour image onto Makoto so as to benefit her later, or as her genuinely caring about him despite his lack of confidence, strength or talent. Like with most stars, it's hard to know what is truly a part of them and what's just for show. It'd be interesting to know more about her intentions, but sadly, I'm not psychic. Number 31. Peko aka the ultimate swordswoman. In light of her basically lying about her past and personality, I was ready to bump Peko down to the bottom tier next to Samugi. However, thanks to her free time events, we get more than a few moments to weed out the truth behind the lies, at least more so than we get with some others. Having been bred from birth to be Fahiko's protector, Peko's emotions were sanded down till she believed that her very existence was to simply be a tool for him and his clan to use as they see fit. Other than being naturally trained in the art of sword fighting, she's also able to sense a person's strength so as to identify if they pose any threat, and as we find out ourselves, is not too bad at convincing others of her false identities. While she may come off as a more basic version of Kyoko, we find out she desires to be more expressive in front of others, most importantly Fuyuhiko, who she hints at having a crush on for many years and possibly fantasises about asking him out, despite their roles to the clan and their long history with one another. A lot of this of course comes down to how much of your conversations with Peko you believe to not just be an act, but actually gives you a detailed account as to what she desires from life. Personally. I'm willing to believe most of it. Number 30. Abuki aka the ultimate musician. There was a part of me that was really pulling to have this character end up higher on this list, but sadly the more rational side of me was giving me a mental look that just said, don't do this man. I don't know whether it was my fondness for the upbeat punk rock girl archetype, but I can definitely say I was quickly enamoured with Ibuki. Now going into her past and contributions to the story, I can admit that in hindsight there are quite a few areas in which she is lacking. She's definitely one of the least impactful characters in the story within all games and she doesn't give much of a reason as to why she left her former band or even show that it left much of an impact on her. What I do enjoy about her though is that like others on this list, she does have a personality that makes any scene that more lively, and while she has little to no emotional baggage for you to help her unpack, in a twist of sorts, she uses her free time events as an opportunity to actually help Hajime deal with his identity problems instead. Based on her energetic and erratic personality, it wouldn't surprise me if Ibuki suffered from some form of ADHD. This would also possibly explain her reasoning for leaving her bandmates, along with some of her kid-like hobbies, though I found little to connect this as a side effect, so I could very easily be talking out my ass. As I said, she is very much a guilty pleasure pick for me. She may be there just to be the life of the party, but she did one hell of a job at it. Number 29. Tenko, aka the ultimate Aikido master. I'll be honest, I don't really know exactly what they were going for with Tenko and her 
well, rather extreme feminist views. As you'll find out very quickly, Tenko doesn't exactly have much of a high opinion of the opposite sex, assuming the very worst from whatever their intentions may be. Much of, if not all of, her distrust comes from her Aikido master's teachings, who, as it turns out, is a man. This is treated as some big revelation to her later. At a young age, she appeared to have some serious anger issues, leading to her parents shipping her to a temple in order to make her more civilized. Her master, who just to remind you is a man, would be overprotective of Tenko, warning her of the threat that all men posed to her. During her years of learning Aikido, she and her master created their own form of martial arts dubbed Neo Aikido. Though I can't say I know how much Neo Aikido differs from the original teachings, Neo style was described as being more aggressive, with both weapons and sneak attacks being incorporated, but with it still retaining the same goal, that is to challenge and claim victory over oneself rather than of that of their opponent. In one scene, we're shown how Tenko is able to fully understand a person's weakness just from how they react in battle. Her obsession with Himiko is apparently due to her admiration for her skills as a performer, along with how cute she is, and that's about it. Honestly, you could have probably worked on something a bit more conceivable, like say she reminds of her past friend or sibling. Hell, you may as well have just come out and probably admitted to her having romantic intentions. Still though, she remains loyal to Himiko through thick and thin, and though Tenko is aware that Himiko is not as invested in her as much as she is, she still encourages Himiko to put more effort into expressing herself, and unlike Mihiru, we see how Tenko's death pushes Himiko forward. Because of how Tenko's narrow-minded beliefs are so front and center at all time, we get only the smallest of evidence of her changing her views on men, had it been confirmed that she first started training under her master at an incredibly young age, I'd probably be a bit more inclined to believe the threshold for indoctrination, but even in the world of Danganronpa, I can't really just shrug it off. Number 28. Chiaki, aka the ultimate gamer. And... Here comes the hate mail. One of the things to consider when diving into these characters is that a flaw with them is not necessarily a mark against them, rather something to contrast with their pros. The problem with Chiaki is that with the exception of her lack of sleep and attention early on, I can't think of much in terms of interesting points to bring up about her. Now that's not to say she doesn't have any plot relevance, but looking back I found it hard to think of any moments that really propelled her to this god tierness that she appears to have ascended to with the fandom. As an AI created to monitor and support the class's rehabilitation, you assume much of her past would have been fabricated if not for a certain prequel anime. Being a lover of all games, she has a wide understanding of the many genre related mechanics that are utilised, giving her much appreciation for those that decide to take on a much different direction, so long as they are still fun and you feel as if you've earned something for your efforts. Though she does have the odd airheaded moments from time to time, she definitely switches on when a murder has been committed, noticing vital clues, visualising past events and deducing others' motives. She may not be much of a pro when compared to Kyoko, but she definitely becomes the ying to Nagito's yang, seeing the killing of others as pointless. Due to knowing the truth behind the 77th class of Hope's Peak, she's determined to push her friends away from the path of despair, and likely sees each death as evidence of them potentially returning to their past lives. It gets to the point that she even slaps Akane for even considering killing Nagito. Her willingness to reveal herself as the traitor in order to save the rest of the class is her final act of hope that her classmates will find a future where they choose their own path forward. Chucky is a character who I feel is mostly made up of little tidbits of details throughout rather than big chunks. Had her growth been a bit more noticeable over the course of the game, along with a strong enough connection with Hajime to rival some of the series' best, it's likely that I'd be in the same boat as the rest of you all. So, um, we cool? Number 27. Mikan aka the ultimate nurse. You know, for as much as we praise all these characters for conquering despair, hearing about all the things that Miken was put through over the years makes me want to steal the crown of ultimate hope away from Makoto and place it on top of Mikan, because by God, does this girl need some happiness in her life? Mikan's willingness to please others, despite whatever harm or humiliation will come of it, is something that I had hoped would gradually start to seep away after a while. But nope, everyone is pretty much either verbally abusive to her or takes little to no notice of said abuse. As she likely pick up on after just having a few interactions with Mika and it becomes evident that her deep-seated paranoia and submissive behaviour is a result of years of mental and physical torture both at school and at home. This led to her misrepresenting those who would bully her as actually caring about her in their own sick way with her simply happy that they were smiling over her pain and humiliation. Uncomfortable yet? 
This in turn led her to fear being ignored and left alone, possibly convincing her to purposely embarrass herself so that she wouldn't ever remain invisible. Her commitment to the sick and injured came about after she came to realise that those who were weaker than her needed attention same as her. Despite the harassment she received during her time on Jabwok Island, she sees it as some of the happiest days in her life, in part to those who have cared about her, but also the help that she has managed to provide while acting as the closest thing to a coroner during the investigations, along with putting herself at risk during the despair disease outbreak. It's unfortunate that her reason for killing came down to simply remembering her despair side as given her tragic life and the message of staying well alert of potential child abuse could have led to one of the biggest gut punches the series has ever had. Though she has been through so much, the point that I even started trying not to picture her past in my mind, I wish that there was something for her to cling on to. Whether it be a happy memory from her past or even a connection to one of the students, I feel as if she could have ended up in the top ranks of this list. But as it is, no bandage seems to be able to cover up these wounds. Number 26, Sonia, aka the ultimate princess. Occasionally we're given a student who at first seems like they were given their title merely because of their family lineage, but later we find out there's more to them than just the blood pumping through their veins. Raised to lead and protect her kingdom, Sonya's talent very much comes from the way she speaks and interacts with others, with her presenting this peaceful aura about her, but also will occasionally switch things up when needing to be a more commanding figure that manages to balance the line without coming off as anything that would seem authoritarian. Having lived a very high class life, Sonya was left with very few friends due to her social status. Having not truly lived the Japanese experience, most of Sonya's earliest knowledge of Japanese culture appears to have been from TV dramas produced within the region that we can assume were exported over to her country. Another of her most notable obsessions is that of her deep fascination of cults and the occult, which while she never gives a concrete reason as to her love of researching them, she strongly believes that it is beneficial to both her country and her family's legacy. Her attitude towards this quest for enlightenment is not out of fear, but simply that knowledge is strength no matter where it comes from. This helps in her forming a connection with Gundam, whose talk of hell and other such unknown powers leads her to spend more time with him than any of the others do. Her fearlessness is also reflected in her determination to survive so as to the very least have a meaningful death for her country. Because she has bared witness to kidnappings, coup d'etats and terrorism in her life, she understands the importance of remaining strong in the eyes of others. Despite this however, she's unable to completely erase her fears and emotions to the same level the likes of Kyoko or Peko. While her odd hobbies and obsessions add quite a bit of flavour to her overall personality, personality, there is a lot that is left to speculation. As I mentioned before, the running gag between her and Kazuichi is alright at first, but by the time she starts coldly acting towards him later on by telling him to be quiet, along with accusing him, only to go back to being nice to him once he hints at liking the attitude, I was just begging her to tell him that she's not interested, so the gag would just die already. To be honest, I'm kinda surprised at Sonya's relevance towards the end of the game, it's not that I think she's a bad character in any way, it's just that I feel she's meant to do so much more but just missed her her mark or something. Number 25 Hajime aka the ultimate blank. Like with Makoto, Hajime's backstory is kept to the bare minimum, in this case to provide an ironic twist towards the game's end, but unlike Makoto, his admiration for Hope's Peak certainly exceeds his, having dreamed of attending so as to solidify his worth to the world. Of course, when waking up to find yourself where you've always wanted to be, but failing to remember how you achieved such a feat, you'd probably be in a very paranoid state as well. This starts to become less of a concern, given the whole people dying around him thing, but soon enough though, it's revealed that he doesn't in fact possess any rare talent, and instead is simply a part of Hope's Peak's reserve course. This revelation certainly hits Hajime hard, not many better thanks to Nagato's mockery of him due to his disgust at the very idea of a student being accepted into Hope's Peak simply because of money. Though the rest of the class do not share in Nagato's disparaging remarks, this does little to uplift Hajime, saddened that he couldn't achieve his dream and was forced to settle with the next best thing. But as mentioned, we get a rather ironic twist as it turns out Hajime is in fact one of the most talented humans on the planet thanks to the Izaru Kamakura project that used him as a vessel for the ultimate hope whose speciality would be talent itself. However, thanks to the interference of Junko, he ends up playing a part in Hope's Peak's massacre and eventually would reprogram the Neo world to fall under the control of the AI Junko. Because of the Neo world's forced shutdown results in Hajime reverting back to Izaru, essentially losing all of his memories on the island in the process, Hajime is forced to put his trust for the future in his own hands and not that of a school or a talent. Personality-wise, one thing you can pick up on early on is Hajime's 
his interest in forming bonds with his classmates, as well as his tendency to be more aggressive at times. One could say this is a knee jerk to him being aware of his lack of any talent, along with him feeling out of place amongst his more talented peers. Because almost all the details in regards to Rizara's overall goal is mostly relegated to the despair arc, it's hard to draw much in terms of parallels between the two personalities in the second game, and even then, Izara's not exactly a very interesting guy on his own. Personality-wise, Hajime comes off being very sceptical of the class in Jabwok Island and has a tendency to come off more aggressive when compared to other protagonists from the series. But even then, there are plenty of times that he shows great concern over what the future holds for everyone else around him. When I thought about who I preferred more, Hajime or Makoto, I didn't have much trouble at first placing Hajime in the lower tier, mostly towards how little the plot revolves around him until the very end. But after comparing the two in terms of growth and personality traits, I had some serious doubts about my decision. Maybe check back in a few years time. Who knows what the future holds. Number 24. Chihiro, aka the ultimate programmer. So, as you may know, given that whole go play before you watch thing that I made very clear to you all, one of the standout twists within the first game is the revelation that the shy girl Chihiro is not in fact a she, but rather a he who was bullied to the point of developing an inferiority complex. I bring this all up first because while the rest of the students refer to both Chihiro and the AI alter ego as a he after this becomes known to the cast, seeing as Chihiro is sadly not alive to address what gender they would prefer to be recognised as, I'm going to just refer to the deceased as a her, so as not to disregard their final wishes. Because that, my friends, is, well, just how I roll. Anyway, while Chihiro may blend into the background a bit due to her shyness, there's definitely some interest to be found in their desire to be strong so as to help the group in some way, seeing as her programming skills aren't seen as being important in order to escape at least at first anyway. Her love of programming fully ignited when she found a way to program her father's database to recognise voice commands, which would be the first stepping stones towards her goal of creating an AI that could exhibit human free thinking. After feeling ashamed for not being strong enough, along with a pep talk from Mondo, Chihiro decides to train both under him as well as reveal her secret to him, feeling a newfound confidence in her ability to be useful to others. While she may not have lived to have seen her efforts paid off, her creation of alter ego would aid in both the downfall to the mastermind's plan, along with the rehabilitation of the Fragments of Despair. There is possibly something that can be interpreted as to why Chihiro chose to train and reveal her secret to Mondo rather than the kinder, more understanding Sakura, other than just the rules put in place for the locker rooms. It's possible that had Chihiro lived long enough to believe in herself, she may have felt different as to how she saw herself rather than how those who abused her made her feel. She may have blended into the background, but for as small as she was, she was truly strong in her own way. Number 23. Celeste aka the ultimate gambler. One of the things that stuck out to me about Celeste is how she just has this aura surrounding her. You feel uncomfortable around her, but not out of a sense of her physically attacking you, but more just from how she knows how to get in your head at times. Which, considering her profession, makes perfect sense. After all, depending on the game, gambling is both equal parts keeping a straight face, but also getting under a person's skin. As I've said, you can split hairs over what is the real truth behind many of these characters, but with Celeste, we can tell who it is she desires to be, and more importantly, get an idea of what part of her identity she is trying to bury from the world. Fixated on the idea that she is born from high class European blood with things like her name and clothing used to accentuate this image that she wants to ingrain in people's minds. Even the authenticity to some of her high stakes gambling tales can be seen as just as questionable but at the very least they are still entertaining lies that can stick with you and do their job at convincing you that she could win at almost any game. It's only until we manage to catch her in her lies or make her mad that her mask begins to crack with her not just losing her temper but also reverting to her normal accent. Celeste's motive for killing may have been one of the most shallow of the series, especially when hearing about her life's goal, but in the end I think it kind of works seeing a character as intense and detached from others as her to still have teenage fantasies. Her final moments of imagining being reincarnated as royalty showing us just how far she is willing to lie to herself so as to escape from reality. Number 22. Hina, aka the ultimate swimming pro. While certainly not one of the more complex characters we see now and then, Hina's optimism managed to shine throughout the first game with her plucky can-do attitude and trusting nature. Having put more than enough hours into multiple sports teams, Hina slowly began to show symptoms of exercise addiction, always feeling the need to keep her body moving out of fear that she'll shrivel up and die. This likely also led to other psychological disorders such as her eating disorder, mostly for donuts, and issues related to her body imagery and lack of feminine traits. She's shown to admire many great athletes by occasionally quoting them 
them, setting her sights that one day she too will be known for her efforts. Bearing all this in mind, it makes sense that she would form a connection with Sakura, not just for their determination to reach their athletic goals, but also their self-awareness towards how feminine they are seen in others' eyes. Their relationship is one of the series' best in my opinion, exemplified by the lengths we see the two are willing to go through for one another during the fourth chapter. Her fear of being alone leads her to attempt to divert the trial away from the rest of the class discovering Sakura's true fate, out of revenge for what she believes to be them having pushed her to commit suicide. While it's easy to question her own grip on life, seeing as she too would have died had the truth not been discovered, having had so many die in such an enclosed environment and then to have the one person who helped give you hope the most be taken from you in such a way is bound to have some effect on your emotional rationality. She does in the end feel regret for her actions afterwards and takes Sakura's final words of working together to heart. Despite her issues related to her exercise addiction not really drawing much attention outside of her free time, she does prove to be a fine example of how one's emotions can be manipulated to push them to doing actions that they will end up regretting later. Number 21. Makoto, aka the ultimate lucky student slash ultimate hope. The OG vanilla protagonist, Makoto is very much the ideal insert character with his normal family, decent school life, and average love of all mediums. As mentioned, when compared to Hajime, he definitely isn't given as much in terms of distinct personality traits, but at the very least, it feels like the narrative is being influenced by him more often. Starting off feeling very much as the black sheep of the class due to only getting accepted because of the school's lottery selection, he forms a bond with Sayaka, helping to ease her worries of being attacked, while she in turn helps him to take more initiative. His compassion, however, almost ends with him being wrongfully accused, but even after knowing the truth behind Saika's betrayal, Makoto still remains firm in his belief, fixated on stopping the mastermind instead of falling into despair, choosing to carry the weight of his classmates' deaths rather than move past them. Over time, his commitment to uncovering the truth while still believing in others starts to affect the rest of the class, most in particular Kyoko, who comes to see him as a trustworthy confidant to aid in her investigation of Hope's Peak. Knowing that the mastermind had rigged the fifth trial in order to eliminate Kyoko from the game, Makoto takes a bullet for her by choosing not to expose her lie, condemning himself if not for a last minute stroke of luck. Eventually, it all builds to this moment where everyone is faced with the awful truth of the world, with them not knowing how to move on, if not for Makoto stepping up to push them to keep moving forward, no matter what the truth may be. Though all of this may not sound like much and just sheer optimism, it's hard to imagine Makoto giving the same inspiring words from when we first saw him at the gates of Hope's Peak, and even after everything that went down during the first trial. Though he has his lucky and unlucky moments at times, he never puts his trust in fate, but in himself and those around him. He's not the deepest well, but he still manages to inspire you to keep moving forward at the end of the day. Number 20. Akane, aka the ultimate gymnast. When thinking of Akane, there are a number of things that come to mind. Her obsessive love of food, her rather striking figure, but after getting to know her more, the thing I now associate with her is her lack of shame, and don't mean that in any negative way whatsoever. Having started out living with an impoverished, sizable family with unemployed parents, Akane did much just to get by, from finding food wherever she could scourge it from, to even having to go through degrading acts involving many older gentlemen. You can't see me, but I'm really trying to force the air quotes through the mic right now. Eventually, one of these men who was a coach convinced her to take up gymnastics under him, where she incorporated her years of parkour to earn big money to help stabilize herself and her family. The way that she just casually talks about the stuff is quite remarkable given the shit she was put through, but in the end, all that matters to her is that she and her family never have to go hungry again. But while she may put on a strong face, it becomes clear that her rebellious nature and large consumption of food are brought upon as a way to not seem weak in people's eyes. One of the reasons to assume as to why she formed such a bond with Nekomaru is how he manages to help her feel strong and not to serve his own interests, unlike her coach. At times she can feel like she is mostly there for the sake of comedy given her lack of contribution to the investigations and trials, but she's still a standout character to me for how she pushes herself forward in life. Number 19. Mondo, aka the ultimate biker gang leader. I'm not what you call a huge fan when it comes to the all around hot headed characters who are violent and mad at everyone for the most petty reasons imaginable. And while Mondo definitely fits this bill to a T within the first few minutes into the game, you start to see him in a much different light when you find out about everything that's weighing him down. From not being the best with girls, to worrying about his appearance and reputation, to what he's going to do with the rest of his life, going so far as to apply to Hope's Peak just to escape his fear of the future. And one least me not forget the small details out of his brother's death sort of being on his hands. Growing up under his older brother, Mondo learned a great deal of things, one of which being always keeping his promises. However, living in his shadow proved to be very difficult, leading him to challenge his brother.
however, so as to prove his worth to the gang, who doubted Mondo's ability to lead them once his time came. This paranoia only got worse after his brother made him promise to keep the gang together after his death, leading to much fear over time, eventually causing him to kill Jahiro out of jealousy for the strength she showed to be true to herself. Even knowing that he could be caught for Jahiro's murder, which he was, Mondo was willing to risk moving her body so as to keep his word by not revealing her secret to the rest of the class. Though his first impression sticks with you, getting to know about his fears, insecurities and regrets helps to humanise a guy who only just prior punched your lights out. Number 18 Ryuma, aka the ultimate tennis pro. Within the first few seconds of meeting Ryuma, we're told about how this one guy managed to land himself in jail for life after utilising his tennis skills to kill off the mafia. Just from that alone, with his unique appearance, is enough to sell you on him immediately. Due to his past mistakes and how his future is now a wasteland of sorrow, Ryuma tragically has next to nothing to fight for, with his last connection to the outside world simply being his pet cat that he was forced to give up. To him, there's little difference to his new life in the killing games and that in jail except one promises death to come a lot quicker. While his reasons for staying alive might come down to him feeling like he needs to be punished for the lives he hurt for defying the mafia, we see how he is actually curious as to whether there is actually anything left for him. While he's defiant that he'll never embrace the joys of tennis again, he'll reminisce often about those he's trained under and even went out of his way to find out if there was anyone waiting for him on the outside. His ending to the main story may be a depressing one, but seeing him choose to fight on at the end of the bonus mode brings a single manly tear to my eye. Number 17 Kumaru, aka the ultimate hope's sister. Ah, the black sheep of the countdown. While Kumaru may hold the title for being the most normal character in Danganronpa, followed only closely by my hero, her lack of any talent is a core part of her growth throughout the majority of the spin-off game. After being in prison post-tragedy for over a year so as to act as a form of motivation for her brother, Kumaru was isolated from all human contact until being forced into an even more deadly game than that of her brothers. Soon enough, she partners up with Toko, with whom Kumaru is able to grow and stand on her own two feet over time, learning about Toko's own fears such as Blood and of the Dark, and witnessing her overcome them. The two would eventually fall out in part to Toko's lack of understanding towards Kamaru and the rest of the untalented mortals, though much of her criticism came from how much Kamaru reminded her of what she was like pre-Hope's peak. When Kamaru is at last given the offer to leave Toa City with no strings attached, she hesitates as to whether she should abandon Toko after everything they've been through, something that she would likely not have given a second thought about when the two first met due to her lack of self-confidence. This can be applied to her decision to forgive Toko go for her betrayal, along with inspiring the rest of the survivors to fight back. The willpower to make these decisions and to fight on are debatably even more of an accomplishment than that of the journey her brother made. The fragility of her hope is put under even more pressure when she almost turns to despair out of revenge for what she believes to be her parents killed. It's only through the sisterly love that Toko has learned from Kamaru that she's able to help her think clearly about what she truly wants and that while she may not be the hope that her brother is, she's still the one in control of her own destiny. When she first escaped captivity, her goal was to run away and the only the only way to do that was to push responsibility onto others, something you'd certainly not call heroic, but it's her time spent with Toko and the many other survivors that teaches her to conquer her fears and to work using her strengths and not just on everyone else's. She can get distressful easily, especially when all hope seems lost and even admits to her fear of being hopeful that it will only mean a greater despair will follow soon after. In the end though, it's neither hope nor despair that wins out, but simply a friendship. Number 16 Suichi AKA the ultimate detective. Wait a minute, a Danganronpa protagonist who has a detailed backstory that they know about right from the start? The hell you say? While he doesn't entirely break away from the typical protagonist tropes, one thing that stands out with Suichi, besides him surprisingly taking the reins midway through the first trial, is that of the guilt he bears for earning his title. Having spent a good few years in the company of his detective uncle, Suichi helps him solving your basic neighbourhood problems. However, unlike most Ultimate students, Suichi earning his title came down to some rather depressing circumstances, as his first official case had tracking down a murderer who he uncovered by accident, with said culprit having taken vengeance on the victim for pushing a family member to suicide. This event topped with the culprit's hatred towards Suichi caused him to lose faith behind hunting for the truth, along with him constantly wearing his hat down so as to obscure his face from others. Having woken up near her, Suichi steadily began to grow an attachment toward Kaede, helping to ease the stress that she was facing from some of the more pricklier class members. Using his skills, he was able to both discover the hidden room, deduce that the mastermind was amongst them by tripwiring the door, 
before and helped orchestrate a trap with Kaede to identify them so as to end the killing game. When Rontaro is found murdered, Suichi manages to take Kaede's lead by focusing the class on gathering evidence rather than accusing each other. However, once he deduces the possibility of the blackened being Kaede, he's left speechless even after being seen as the prime suspect. At first seeming like he's acting this way because he doesn't know how to defend himself, in actuality he's simply lost in thought trying to escape the truth he's discovered, knowing that he aided Kaede's paranoia and that he has to once again hurt someone with justified intentions. Understanding that Kaede wants him to expose the truth so the rest of the cast will not give up hope, he does what he can to prove that Rentaro's death was not in cold blood. Though inspired by Kaede having even taken her advice and removed his hat, Suichi still remains uncertain of seeking the truth, leading Kaito to help him grow his confidence better by committing to his training regiment. Over time he's met with hard truths that many within the class are unwilling to accept and even scold him for. It's in the final trial that Suichi not only has to convince his classmates but more importantly the outside world of the truth they choose not to accept. His biggest test may come early on but we see how he's forced to carry this weight over the course of each chapter determined not to stray away for the sake of his classmates survival. With that said he still has faith in others as seen in the fifth trial where he leaves the fate of everyone in Kaito's hands believing in whatever the choice that his friend makes will be the right one. Besides his backstory and his slight habit of being too shy to confront others, there's not that much that separates him from other protagonists, but his journey is by far one of the most demanding, forcing him to uncover truths that many would prefer remain buried forever. Number 15. Kokichi, aka the ultimate supreme leader. And the winner for the most punchable face in all video games goes to Kokichi. It's funny how hard it is to come up with words to describe how detestable this character comes off as. The best way I feel to describe him is if the boy who cried wolf didn't care about his sheep getting eaten and just kept on lying until the village just banished him. Over the series we see characters who are not the easiest to grasp at first glance with the likes of Junko or Nagito, but Kokichi is so twisted and distorted thanks to the mountain of lies behind him that he might as well be a living Roshak test. The the closest thing to concrete facts we get about Kokichi is how rather than running a worldwide criminal organisation, in reality, well when I say reality, you know what I mean, he's actually just a part of a band of misfits who like to play pranks and on top of that despises killing. The same level of confidence can't be said about his rapid fire lies with him appearing to enjoy playing with others emotions even when taken too far like making them feel like their lives are at risk. Much of the time he'll create tension and chaos for the class like stealing their motivation videos so as to reveal everyone's secret to each other something that could, under a very certain light, be seen as a way to dispel any thought of committing a murder. Within just about each of the class trials, he's one of the most vocal of the cast, almost always dictating the flow of the conversation. In his eyes, the way to unmask the blackened is by seeing people's reactions to how the trial pushes and pulls amongst the class, damn be they innocent or not. Towards the end, despite how outright evil he comes off as, he seeks to beat the mastermind by bending their rules like removing the students' need to escape or coming up with an impossible murder. In a way, his tapestry of lies could be be seen as purely there just to fool the mastermind, like someone shuffling cups for way too long to the point that you look away for one second and they've beaten you. Because of this, like with many of the characters hiding behind a lie, it's up to your personal interpretation as to whether he truly genuinely felt sad over the deaths of his classmates. His acts of cruelty, whether it be his mockery of Kibo Mew, or to a much larger extent, his utter gleefulness over tricking Gota into killing Mew, can come off as so villainous it can be hard to justify him as a necessary evil. His act does his job of creating a character who, while lacking an airtight backstory, making his free time events rather superfluous, stands as an unpredictable antagonist who, at the very least, was never boring. Number 14 Gonta, aka the Ultimate Entomologist. Here's a lesson, don't grow attached to a friendly, innocent, simple-minded giant who only wants to be accepted by everyone because you're just gonna cry your eyes out by the end. Having wandered off into the wilderness at a young age and living most of his childhood under the care of a tribe of evolved reptiles, just go with it. Gonta grew to become one with nature, most in particular the many insects he would come across in his travels. Eventually he was able to return to his original family but was ostracised for his new lifestyle believing it to be unbecoming of their family name. Thus he set himself the goal of becoming what the world considered a true gentleman in the hopes of bridging his two families. While he has many of his key bases covered for what one would consider a gentleman, he has a habit of being a little too forceful without noticing and gets incredibly mad whenever he feels insects are ever at risk or seen in a bad light. Having learned almost 
almost all he knows from his adoptive family, going to his English, or Japanese technically, can have his inconsistencies like his habit of speaking in the third person and confusing words like poor for hand. He's very self-conscious of his lack of intelligence, often asking others for what their definition of a gentleman is so as to aid him if he ever happens to peter off the beaten path. In the end, due to what he thinks he knows about the outside world, he, or to be more exact his avatar version of himself, is forced to make the ultimate choice of letting his classmates die, least they learn the world's awful truth. His death is made even more tragic as a result of him not being able to comprehend the virtual world and the events that took place, trusting in his friends to do what is right rather than fight for his survival. The Kidding Games have seen many out of place high spirited students take part in them, but none feel more ill suited than Gonta, which makes his fate as the Blackened all the more tragic. While he says his quest is to become a gentleman, it's more accurate to say that all he wants is to do the right thing. And in the deadly new world he's forced to live in, doing the right thing is not as clear as we'd like it to be. Number 13. Junko, aka the ultimate fashionista slash despair. After playing through all these games and witnessing all these odd yet colourful characters, seeing this teenage model become the symbol for depression is still one of the most absurd things to come out of them. While she technically doesn't hang with the class in person during the killing game, her brief but memorable appearances certainly provide some insight into the madness that is contained within. As the antagonist of the series, just about everything across multiple games can be traced back to Junko as its catalyst. From the Hope's Peak Massacre to the tragedy being widespread across the world, from the fragments of despair to the Warriors of Hope, and of course, the killing games themselves. All this towards one simple goal, the utter pleasure of despair. Seeing all this pain and suffering is like a drug to her, but even that isn't enough, as the only thing better than experiencing all this despair is knowing that the world must be forced to bask in that same despair because of you. She'll rapidly switch personalities after she's bored and will even do unpredictable things like killing her own sister just to see if she can add even more despair to the pile. Oddly enough, it's only by being defeated and seeing her plans fail right when victory was in her grasp that she finally gets the true ultimate despair that she has longed for. There are many who will say they find her lack of a backstory or reason as to her obsession with despair to be a major mark against her as an antagonist. But in the world of Danganronpa, where hope and despair are jacked up to the point they may as well be coursing through our veins, I personally think it makes sense to write her as this force of nature that can't be weighed down by the external constraints of mere humans. Number 12. Kaede, aka the ultimate pianist. I like to think, after seeing the first two games, the writers were like, you know what, we tend to go so so easy at the start, but why don't we go just for the gut punch right in the first trial? In fact, why don't we go one step further and make it one of the most tearful farewells the series has ever had. As one of the few core students that have a talent outside the usual three we see, Kaede's goal is a simple one of just wanting to use her music to put smiles on people's faces. From almost the start of E3, when the rules of the killing game were laid out to the class, Kaede just jumps in and does all she can to push any full of killing from her classmates' minds, inspiring them to work together in order to escape. However, after failing the death road of despair too many times and having their lives put on the line unless someone is killed, many begin to lose faith in each other along with Kaede's hopeful perspective. The real heartbreaking moment comes when Kaede decides to dirty her hands by killing who she believes to be the mastermind so as to save her classmates. Despite being told she can leave the school without the need for a trial, she chooses to stay in the last ditch effort to find out if the mastermind is truly among them, but also to inspire the class to move forward, using her time left to push Suichi to discover the truth and to face it head on. She even goes a step further by almost working against Suichi once he realises he has to prove what he knows to the class, just so he can be better motivated and eliminate any doubt behind the truth. While many protagonists tend to avoid addressing noticeable issues with their classmates, Kaede will often confront things like Ryuma's edginess, Mew's lack of any friends, or Kokichi claiming to run a worldwide organisation. This more forceful behaviour works as a double-edged sword, helping to inspire many due to her level of confidence, but also makes it hard for her to notice when she gives them little choice as seen with the death road along with her free time lessons with Suichi. In the end, it's her determination and eagerness to see a happy ending for everyone that leads to her becoming the blackened. But even then, when she knows what's to come, she still remains hopeful that a happy ending for everyone is waiting even beyond her death. Now, who wants to lie back in the desk chair, close their eyes and cry a single tear while listening to Claire de Lune? Number 11. Gundam, aka the Ultimate Breeder. I'm sorry, let me go over that again, but this time under his full title, Gundam Tanaka, the Supreme Overlord of Ice. 
love it. Though he may come off as a bit over dramatic, even if he is the so called spawn of the underworld, there's a lot of fun to be had whenever in Gundam's majestic presence. Claiming to be the offspring of an angel and a demon, Gundam does all that he can to mask this illusion that he's a being beyond human comprehension who spent the majority of his time training beast demons, all while accompanied by his four dark divas of destruction. Despite his commitment to disassociating himself from the mere mortals of the world, he still makes use out of some of the more modern day conveniences like his webpage. Whenever given a direct reason as to why he gets so defensive when others come near him, though it's not hard to believe that he might suffer from happy phobia, only letting those he truly trusts touch him. He does manage to find a kindred spirit of sorts with Sonya during the fourth chapter, thanks to her interest in the occult, with Gundam doing what he can to not appear nervous whenever she compliments him. While he claims that he killed Nekromara out of his belief that dying of suicide was an insult to life itself, it's hinted that his intention was to save as many as he could, whether he or Nekomaru ended up as the Blackened, and that given that the trial did not come to the correct conclusion, would have broken his vow of survival. Even at the very end, he remains fearless of death, choosing to face it head on, laughing for himself and his classmates. Number 10. Himiko aka the ultimate magician. While she may not be the poster child for youthful energy, there's something just adorable about Himiko. Yes, even more than Chiaki, and I will fight... You know what? Uh, I'm too tired to fight. Like with Gundam, Himiko is committed to the illusion that the power she wields is no simple trick. Unlike with Gundam though, there are many who are quick to critique and poke holes in her craft. Because of this, she will constantly get defensive, correcting others, whether it be addressing her as a magician rather than as a mage, or more often, their refusal to address her talent as actual magic. Besides her magic though, there is very little effort that Himiko puts into her day-to-day -day life, preferring others to do most of the work, and even considers expressing emotion to be a pain. After training under her master as his assistant, she eventually began to succeed him, leading so the quality of his acts decreased rapidly until he eventually abandoned Himiko. Because of her admiration for her master and possible lack of friends, Himiko would construe these events as being simply foul play from dark forces and that he left so as to fight these people and protect her. While it's not outright stated, it's possible that she developed into this emotionless husk due to negative thoughts behind the reality of the situation affecting her willpower. It's during the third chapter that she's forced to experience a roller coaster of emotions, with her feeling guilty for showing little affection towards Tenko, her anger towards the idea that Tenko killed Angie then committed suicide, her submission to the pain of them being accused as the one who murdered Tenko, to finally crying over the loss of her friends and feeling alone once again. It's from here on that we see Himiko take Tenko's final words of living life facing forward to heart by doing what she can to break away from her bottled up past self and make sure that no matter what, both her and Angie's deaths were not in vain. I'll admit, I try my best to not give extra points to characters that I like simply because I find them to be adorable or how they remind me of some other character from a series I like. Unlike Kabuki, however, but there's a lot of myself I see in Himiko, from her lack of energy towards day-to-day -to -day tasks due to her passion towards her hobby, to being irritated that said hobby sees little of the same enthusiasm from others. But even with all that, I like how unlike Hyoko and Taka, we see both a great struggle of coming to terms with someone's death, along with a huge positive payoff that carries across the story and maybe even helps others like Maki open up later down the line. She's not the most eye-opening character from the series, but I have to say, there is most definitely something magical about her in the end. Number 9 Nekomaru, aka the ultimate team manager. For as bulky and built as Nekomaru is, you'd think at first someone like him would be more suited on the field instead of on the sideline. But as you come to learn from him, you can still feel victorious backing someone up, even if you're not the one in the winner's circle at the end. When first meeting Nekomaru, the guy tries to get the very best out of you right away through the simple act of screaming your name at him. In the wake of being given a short life expectancy, along with being motivated by another sick kid who was working as a manager for a baseball team, Nekomaru decided to dedicate his remaining years to the physical development of others as well as learning how to achieve these results through dieting and relaxation. This commitment to others would include his classmates, most in particular Kane, who spent much time training with Nekomaru along with him performing what he calls it on her. While his almost sacrifice to save Kane feeds into their bond, there's little doubt I have that he would do the same for just about any of his classmates. Even when he becomes a robot, he's still as optimistic as ever, because so long as everyone else is safe and able to be the best they can, he's fine being a machine for the rest of his days. Though it isn't outright stated, he seems fine knowing that he could die in his fight with Gundam because at the very least he knows that everyone have a chance to avoid dying of starvation. In his own way, he's able to bring hope to his class with his almost selfless goal of helping others make the impossible possible. Number 8 
Maki, aka the ultimate child caregiver slash assassin. Let me ask you guys, can love bloom even in a game in which students are forced to kill one another to survive? Right after meeting Maki, you can tell she's not exactly very forthright about her talent and given her history along with the killing game being forced on them, you can understand why she may not want others to know that she's killed hundreds of people within her lifetime. Having grown up in a rundown orphanage, Maki along with the rest of her elder orphans spend much of their time looking out for the youngest of the household having many of them look up to her despite her irritation over the obligation. Eventually, Maki and another orphan, who happened to be one of her closest friends, were scouted to become a part of an assassin training program in return for donations to their orphanage. Though at first much interest was directed towards her friend thanks to her skills outweighing Maki's, Maki would end up openly requesting the position, believing it to be a death sentence for her friend as a result of the trauma that lay ahead. From that day on, Maki entered a world that started and ended each day with pain and suffering so as to mould her into an emotionless being capable of killing without remorse and taking one's own life without hesitation. Though her emotions would be drained from her, she never once forgot about the orphans that she continued to support through the life that she now lived, doing all she could to blend into the background so as to avoid the curiosity of others. Eventually her secret comes to light, though with Kaito reassuring everyone that he still believes in her just as much as he did before her true talent was revealed. Similar to how he handled Suichi, Kaito confronts Maki's issues head on, asking her to question who her enemy is and that rather than running away she needs to stand up to it, offering to train her, though in reality, to help her adjust back to socialising with others once again. Over time, we see her open up more to both Kaito and Suichi, with Kaito even so adorably referring to her as Maki Roll. She even shows great concern for Kaito as his condition becomes more apparent to the class, with her even snapping when his life is threatened by Kokichi. After believing that she not only mistakenly poisoned Kaito but handed the antidote directly to Kokichi, only for him to drink it in front of them both, she makes it her mission to ensure that no matter what happens, Kokichi is left dead, despite despite knowing that everyone else will die as well. When the fifth trial shakes up due to the possibility of Kaito having killed Kokichi instead, Maki does all that she can to find a way to spare him even when he's on death's doorstep. While Maki may not have been that attached to her life at the orphanage, there are signs that she's still nostalgic for her time there and that keeping it alive gives her life purpose. To her, Kaito is the one good thing to happen to her in a life that was destined to have her kill and never love till the end of her days. It's only until Kaito convinces her that life can be more and that things like friends and love are not forever gone. With all that laid out to you all, I'm confident you can figure out the answer to my earlier question. Number seven, Sakura. AKA the ultimate martial artist. Though at first glance you'd expect her to be the least likely to turn up as a victim in the killing games, as you come to better understand Sakura, you learn how she's just as unlikely to wind up as the murderer. Having been training for as long as she can remember by her father, along with professionals from an array of different fighting styles, Sakura was raised to become the world's strongest human, to the point the only opponent left in her way was that of her lifelong rival and first love, Kenshiro, who ended up eventually passing the title over to Sakura after falling ill, though promising that they would both one day find out who is truly worthy of the title. While she has no issues with her gender, she does feel that she must train harder to break away from what limits are expected of her. This leads her to hide her affection for Kenshiro, seeing it as an omission of her womanly restrictions. Intimidating presence aside, Sakura is only ever pushed to use her skills whenever her classmates are threatened, most in particular Hina. While she may have only been forced to act as a safeguard for the mastermind in case the first motive failed, her role as a spy would lead to much paranoia within the group once discovered, causing the class to be split on whether they could trust her. Fearing for her classmates' safety, along with Monokuma threatening the life of what is either assumed to be Kenshiro or that of her dojo, Sakura chooses to end her life so as to free herself from his control, as well as to unite her class that even till the very end she saw as her friends. There is something of just a kind and noble heart behind Sakura. Though her revered skills may have little use within the killing games, there's just a sense of comfort around her knowing that she'd willingly defend and even die for her classmates to see them escape this hell. Number six. Kaito, aka the ultimate astronaut. Admittedly, right after meeting Kaito, I never would have pegged him to not only have remained in the game for as long as he does, but to come out as one of the most endearing characters from the entire series. Though you'd think he'd be into all these science and technology surrounding space travel, Kaito's goal throughout life has pretty much just been about breaking through boundaries. At a young age, he apparently went off on many adventures, both on the high seas and land, but after conquering both, he set his sights on the next biggest thing. It wasn't all fighting pirates and discovering 
from lost cities though as he would often take on sidekicks of all ages and backgrounds helping to make them the legends that they are today. He can be very full of himself often proclaiming to be adored by crying children that a more fitting title for him would be the ultimate hero. Still despite his need to reassure others of his talents many of his actions do reflect those of heroes we've seen before in the series. One thing that is noticeable is that of his detest for limitations. With him not only working around the system to meet the space program's entry exam requirements but also his frustration over the ultimatum within the killing games that he and his classmates are forced into with no escape. There are many times over the course of V3 where Kaito will try to fight against the flow of the current as seen in the second trial where rather than accusing Maki when the two are left as the only remaining suspects he instead defends her simply justifying it as a gut feeling. His confidence in his emotions though able to inspire both Suichi and Maki to overcome their weaknesses ends up getting in the way when logic is needed to keep everyone safe as seen when he refuses to believe that the kind-hearted Gonta is in fact the blackened and not the despicable Kokichi. His inner battle against logic is also seen in his belief that despite his illness he'll still beat the odds and make it into space before his death. His decision to go along with Kokichi's plan in the fifth chapter is motivated by both his love for Maki but also out of the temptation of getting to outsmart the mastermind. It's when he sees just how much faith Suichi has in him that he in turn puts his faith in his classmates and abandons the plan. Though we may share many similarities with Nekomaru from such things as his upbeat personality, commitment to other self-improvement and short life expectancy. Unlike Nekomaru, his fears and flaws are drawn out thanks to our game's protagonist and by the end that becomes the last thing he has to conquer. Number 5 Toko aka the ultimate writing prodigy. <laughs> There is a lot of baggage to unpack with this girl here. After a, well, complicated childhood of having two mothers due to her father's infidelity, each of whom didn't want her along with a string of traumatic and abusive related events at both home and school, Toko developed not only a love for romance novels as a form of escapism, but also ended up creating a serial killer split personality formed out of the trauma she had built up over the years, who would pop up on occasion to kill young men she considered cute. While the two's memories would be blocked while the other was at the wheel, they would still share in each other's emotions such as anger and desire. If you're someone who believes that the cracks in your past can be spun to craft works of art slash entertainment then it's not hard to believe the quality of work of Ntoko's stories. Her fear of being mocked is manifested through such tendencies as trying to avoid any form of conversation, being incredibly skeptical and shaming girls like Hina and Komaru for both their bodies and interests. Her submissive relationship with Byakuya is almost another can of worms in itself with both sides of her being enamoured by his blunt and cold hearted personality to the point that she dedicates the rest of her life to his will despite his disgust and need to get away from her. While this does tame her psychotic side, it's her relationship with Komaru that sets her on the path to become a better person. Due to her past killing game experience and her need to protect Komaru so as to please her master, she's put in a position where she feels the need to take more action with her scolding even being justified. For the most part. Eventually her friendship with Komaru grows even stronger than that of her dedication to Byakuya, choosing her only friend's freedom over her desire to be with him. While her development may have only really begun in Ultra Despair Girls, it's still one of the most heartwarming growths over the course of the entire series. Number 4 Fuyuhiko aka the ultimate Yakuza I guess it's true what they say, once you hit rock bottom, there really is only one place left to go. First impressions are a big deal when it comes to a character and Fuyuhiko may as well have found a way to spit in your real world face. His vicious, cold and unsociable attitude towards others at the start leaves him as the only rotten apple of the orchard on Jabberwock. Well, at least till Naikato shows his true side. It's only till the second trial where we start to understand him better and see him let down his guard, where he's given the choice to escape the island so long as he lets his classmates die and admits to Pekko being nothing more but a tool to him. And while half his reason for not going through with it comes down to his inability to commit such a soul blackening act, the other comes from his shame for how he and his family's way of life forced Pekko to emotionally detach herself from him, at least in his presence anyway. Immediately after having recovered from his injuries, he's so guilt ridden over the deaths of Mihiro and Pekko that he not only does a complete 180 towards how open he is with everyone, but even injures himself after Hyoko refuses his sincere apology. His willingness to help watch over the six students in the third chapter despite not having made any physical contact with them reassures much of the class that he is indeed a changed man, seeing himself as beneath everyone, claiming that his life is a spare due to Pekko's sacrifice. It's because of his guilt that he not only takes note of Akane's own turmoil for endangering Nekomaru, but also gets very personal, reassuring her, something that few can do for him. Though it's certainly hard to pick 
pick up on it first, it becomes clear that Fuyuhiko feels unworthy of his title, in part to his younger sister being offered the position as the clan's next leader, mostly thanks to her bearing many of the same qualities found in the two's deceased uncle. Although she ended up declining the offer, this did little to avoid casting a shadow onto her brother. Add on to this his insecurities about his height and infant-like face, and you can understand why he was so determined to come off as thuggish as he was from the start, and why he felt the need to not rely on others' aid. Because of his family's... well business, he had to witness a lot of brutal things, with death making more than a few appearances. Having seen his family use violence to solve almost all of their disputes, he admits to admiring the ways in which his classmates avoid turning to their more selfish survival instincts. There are very few characters that change as suddenly as Fuyuhiko does, mostly due to character consistency during free time events, but while surprising at first, you understand the man that Fuyuhiko was trying to become in the world he was born to. Guilt is definitely not an uncommon theme within the series, but usually it's only even tucked away in free time events or during someone's confession near the end of a trial. And though it's unclear as to how Fuyuhiko feels about committing to his family's legacy, especially considering his sister's death and all, he comes out a better and stronger person thanks to the camaraderie he builds with his classmates, seeing a path forward built from strengthening the bonds with others rather than severing them. Number 3 Nagito aka the ultimate lucky student. Well, this ain't gonna be a short one to cover. Though many can see Nagato as essentially the polar opposite of Junko, it's better to say that he's essentially what would happen if Makoto's hopeful beliefs were taken to an extreme. If Junko's goal is to create hope in order to snatch it away and feed off the despair left in its wake, then Nagato views despair as an opportunity for hope to flourish, and if a strong hope can lead to an even greater despair, then surely there is truth to be found in the exact opposite. Despite his incredible luck, Nagato sees himself and everyone else deemed normal as simply tools to be used by the architects that are the ultimates of Hope's Peak. To him, the ultimates are almost superheroes of Hope while he's just the fanboy there to push them forward, with him even jokingly calling himself the ultimate, ultimate fanatic. Having been born into a wealthy family, Nagato found himself hit with some of the worst kind of luck imaginable over the course of his life, only for things to end up on a positive note of sorts each time. Such examples being his parents dying after having their plane hit by an asteroid only for him to inherit their fortune afterwards, or being diagnosed with brain cancer right before getting accepted into Hope's Peak. This cycle of misfortune, only to be followed by fortune, led him to believe that it was all part of Hope's plan, if you will, and due to his bad luck, he was unable to ever become a symbol of Hope, but could still find meaning in sacrificing himself for the cause. While he acts relatively normal towards the 77th class after their awakening into the Neo world, once the killing game begins, he fears not for the safety of anyone, but instead of his classmates simply remaining on the island, depriving the world of all their potential. Thus, despite tension starting out rather calm at the start, he does what he can to push the class into taking part, at the assurance that hope will inevitably prevail. Because of his luck's unpredictable nature, his plans and allegiances can change on a whim depending on where hope shines the strongest, such as putting himself up to be killed and even protecting Teru Teru, only to turn on him once the class works together to find Teru Teru out to be the blackened. Once the truth behind the 77th class is found out by Nagato, his views on his classmates and the killing game drastically changes, seeing himself as the one to spare the world of their despair-infected souls by ending them and himself once and for all, essentially making himself what he believes he could never be, that being the ultimate hope. At the very beginning to the first chapter up to its trial, there are moments where we get to see hints of what life would be like for him and Hajime, and not have one be obsessed with creating despair to keep hope alive. Throughout his time, we get to see just how much intelligence is lying behind all that madness, most in particular during the trials, where he's able to make tons of deductions that the rest of the class overlook. Nagato's real-world feelings towards Junko are an interesting subject, as he claims to despise her, naturally for her embodiment of despair, yet almost wishes for her to remain ever present, whether it be so he can feel the joy in playing a part in her downfall, or simply for the hope that is gained out of foiling her. He's undeniably one of the most complex of the series cast, and while his obsession doesn't exactly have you looking at him like he's a close friend that you can rely on, he helps in bringing some nice commentary on the joys to be found in overcoming life's hurdles, and how grateful we should be for their existence. Number 2 Byakuya, aka the ultimate affluent progeny. There have been a lot of characters on here, have certainly been a handful to get on with, but one thing is for sure is that so long as they are both interesting and entertaining, they can be as much of an arsehole to you as they like. Byakuya already comes off as one of the most pompous characters you'll see in any media, mostly just from his humongous superiority complex, but when you're forced to live in a world as high class, competitive and devoid of emotion as his, it's not at all hard to believe that a man like him could exist. To him, at first at least, the killing game is yet another test for him to prove his 
worth of controlling his family's empire, something that he's already been forced to do terrible things simply to earn the right to bear the Togami name. While he considers himself part of the world's greatest elite, the idea of things being handed to him because of his birth is the greatest insult of them all to him. We see how truly Machiavellian he is during the second trial, where despite knowing both the culprit and the truth about Genocide Jack, he uses this trial as a test to measure up any within the class who could potentially become a risk to him later on, if so when he chooses to become the Blackened. The turning point for Byaka comes around when he is caught completely off guard by the revelation that Sakura's death was the result of a suicide to motivate the class and not by anyone with selfish motivations. The fact that his life was almost ended because of his emotional detachment makes him realise that at the very least his survival does depend on people like Makoto who view human nature and the world very differently from him. Over time, after the events of Hope's Peak, we get to see just how much of an impression Makoto would continue to leave on him, with Byakuya not just coming to respect him, but to go on and follow him into even more deadlier situations. Seeing a character who you think of as an adversary for our hero at first, slowly becoming one of their closest allies is certainly nothing new, especially in manga and anime, but there's such an authentic feeling to how Byakuya becomes this beacon of hope for someone who would barely mince words with anyone he saw as less than nine tenths of himself. Even though he won't, and might never will, admit to needing his classmates directly to them, I think they're smart enough to read between the lines. And finally, number one, Kiyoko, aka the ultimate detective. There is a part of me that wants to say that this was a long and arduous inner debate I had with myself for the top pick, but that would be a big lie. Even by the end of the first trial, I could tell Kyoko was something special. Starting off by just lingering in the background, as soon as the first murder is committed, Kyoko just snaps into action, being able to piece together events just from the most minute of details, which as we find out, fits into her family's detective code as a neutral force there to be when time is needed and to be ignored by the world when they aren't. Though Kyoko may come off as emotionally distant, she knows full well that people can very easily exploit you when you expose your feelings towards something or someone one as seen with characters like Sakura and Maki. Even then, she's smart enough to fake her emotions so as to undermine her opponents and knows how to handle people during some of their more distressing moments, as shown early on when she knew that Makoto would have to find out the truth to Sayaka's failed murder for himself to believe it, and her assurance that Sayaka's message was intended to save him. With all this on paper, some may accuse Kyoko of being too much of a Mary Sue, but she makes it clear that she's none too happy when she's aware someone knows something she doesn't, as seen when she neglects Makoto for not telling her about Sayaka's temporary loyalty to the mastermind, or when she's determined to find out the fate of her father. Speaking of which, having her father abandon her in her family's detective legacy is also an area in which she has little trouble coming to terms with, going so far as to attend Hope's Peak, revealing herself to the world, just to properly sever ties with him. When Kyoko finds a picture of herself in his room, she gets mad at the idea of him making her conflicted over her feelings for him, preferring her father to be the villain her grandfather made him out to be so she could confidently cut ties. While there's often times where she knows the answer to things right away, she knows that she needs someone as pure and simple minded as Makoto to steer the class towards the answer they seek. When Makoto reveals that he not only believes in Kyoko but also sees themselves as friends, she's generally shocked by the exchange seeing as she's pretty much just been using him up to this point and figures with all of her sleuthing around she'd be the prime suspect as the traitor. This act of hope not only convinces her to clue in Makoto on what she's uncovered but also to bet everything in the fifth trial, Makoto helping her to find a way to beat the rigged trial rather than throwing him under the bus so as to uncover the truth. When she woke up with the rest of the class, she was someone who would use whatever and whoever she could to uncover the truth. By the end, she would learn to instead have faith in others to meet those same results, all while keeping hope alive. In my opinion, the first game's story may be viewed through Makoto's eyes, but I feel that it's very much Kyoko's story, the same way it is for Furiosa in Mad Max 4. She, along with others on this list, grow by having their beliefs and insecurities challenged, whether it be accepting reality, finding friendship, or even love in a cruel world, that you don't need to close yourself up to feel strong and that you shouldn't be afraid to open yourself up to others. One of the questions brought up in V3 is that of the power of fiction, whether it has the power to change the world and while I can't personally speak for everyone, I'll just say that I never thought I'd see a series end with its characters fighting against having their series continue and I would be willingly choosing their needs over my own. And... There we have it guys, this was a lot to cover, to the point that I was certain that I should just push it aside for a while, but then all of a sudden the floodgates opened and there was just this rush of subscribers that blew my mind. After that, 
I knew I had to get this video done fast to prove to you all just how much your faith in me truly pushed me to go even further. While these videos may take their sweet ass time to come out, I make sure to do as much as I can to show you all just how much I care about the topic at hand. And Dang and Romper was truly an experience like no other that left a huge impact on me. So big in fact that I'm very tempted to look into doing other Danganronpa related topics such as worst to best characters and executions seeing as I have over 120 hours worth of footage. As always thank you so much for your time, was everything to your liking or was this the biggest, most awful, most tragic list in human history? Feel free to share some of your own favourite and least favourite students and if you want you can always like this video or go one step further and subscribe for even more hot cost goodness. Take care now and remember to keep hope alive.